Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the invitation of CIW. Um, so uh, my topic today is about the um, technology transfer from China to African countries. Uh, I will use the example of uh, Ethiopia. Um, and we're going to see you know, uh, the breadth and consequences of this uh, uh, technology transfer. So um, this is the structure of today's talk. Um, so I will begin by um, give you a portrayal of the Chinese uh, economic presence in Africa. Um, and then follow that, uh, I will um, try to um, raise the question why you know, the technology and technology transfer matters uh, in the China-Africa relations. And then after that, I will give you um, like some case studies in the Chinese companies operating in Ethiopia. So the first one will be a state-owned enterprises, uh, which was awarded uh, a construction project by the uh, Ethiopian government. And the second case is about uh, a labor company operating uh, as a subcontractor of this construction project. Uh, and the third case is the, uh, a private textile company uh, in, the, um, in an industrial park uh, in Ethiopia. So I'll just examine uh, the technology transfer in these three uh, case companies. And to follow that, uh, I'll just have a brief discussion and conclusions um, on the, um, the African agency. So which means that do they help Africans also have some say in the process of technology transfer uh, and the, effecting, the effectiveness of the uh, transfer. Okay. So um, first, let's uh, look at these two graphs. Um, so the first one is the um, shows the China's FDI worldwide, uh, and as well as the portion uh, in Africa, uh, which is represented by the uh, uh, green bars. So you can see there's a fluctuations uh, of the Chinese FDI worldwide, but you can see uh, you know the growth of FDIs in African continents is. Um, um, stably has been uh, you know, uh, growing gradually. Uh, and the, uh, the second graph is the comparison between the Chinese FDI uh, versus the uh, US FDI to Africa. So you can see um, 2012 is the turning point uh, when the Chinese FDIs um, um, become like uh, outnumber the uh, US um, uh, FDI in Africa. So um, if we um, break down the FDIs to sectors, uh, you can see that so the Chinese economic presence not only in the mining sectors, but they're, they're growing the, uh, in the construction and manufacturing. Um, and besides these FDIs, there's you know, another form of uh, China's Chinese economic um, presence in Africa, which is the um, contract uh, engineering and construction projects. So in Chinese, it's called the uh, Dui Wai Chen Bao Gong Chen. Uh, and you can see the from the uh, graph on the right that they almost uh, ten times of the um, total, you know, FDI volumes um, um, uh, in terms of the FDI. So we will come back to this. Um, contract uh, engineering and construction projects later. So why I picked technology? Um, so basically, um, technology is, you know, um, kind of specialized knowledge related to production. So if you're going to produce something, uh, you need technology. You have to follow these procedures. It's, and it also matters to, um, uh, Africa countries. So if you look at the, um, you know, the evolution of the industrial policies in technology and the technology in Africa, you can see that so after the independence, uh, there was a so-called import substitutions, uh, which um, you know, emphasized the self-sufficiency. So the African countries would uh, um, adopt uh, uh, protective trade policies that limit imports of manufactured goods and then subsidize of the domestic manufacturing. Um, so uh, the aim is to have this homegrown technology. 
As this changed in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, when there's the, um, the African economy um, was under the scheme of the uh, structure adjustment uh, led by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So at that time, uh, there are a lot of prioritizations and the liberalization trade uh, and foreign investment. And so the um, industrial base uh, uh, of African continents also like shrink during that time. So in the new century, uh, there was a new um, trend of uh, export substitution. Um, so which means that they, um, for example, they just uh, follow up the um, industrial strategies of Asian countries and they set up the um, export uh, zones and they introduce the um, foreign connectors in the form of uh, FDIs and in hope that they can uh, produce quality goods that can be competitive in the international market. So, um, and there are also theoretical concerns. Uh, so the first is the, um, because I'm a trainer and I'm an anthropologist, so there's a theory of the um, embeddedness of the technology, which means that technologies, uh, you cannot separate the technology from the um, uh, society. So the technology processes are also uh, often constrained by and embedded in societies. So if we um, use this concept of embeddedness to the China-African um, relations, so the question would be, uh, would there any like constraining or facilitating factors um, that underpin the technology transfer? Um, and then I also have the concern of the uh, African agency um, because um, the Chinese economic or political presence in Africa is often imagined as like dominating um, or that you know the China Chinese capital always uh, took the initiative um, but there's a, the, uh, the rise of the school of African agency which argues that uh, in some cases the African countries and individuals uh, they also have the uh, bargaining power. Uh, they have the, you know, the uh, the intention or, or the means to control uh, or to uh, navigate all the processes, including the technology transfer. So the question is that where can we find an African uh, agency in the process of technology transfer? So um, there is the um, the recent. Uh, literature has that have been focusing on the uh, technology transfer proposed the four models um, by the um, scholar Deborah Brottingham. Um, there are modelings uh, and some contraction and speeding lower and competition. So the modeling uh, means that the local firms can just model uh, after what the Chinese firms produce um, and they can just a follow suit. And the second subcontraction is that the uh, local companies can act as the subcontractors uh, and they collaborate with the Chinese companies. And through the collaborations, uh, they adopt or absorb, uh, absorb the uh, technology from the Chinese companies. And there's a spilling, a, a spilling over uh, effect, which means that um, you know, if someone was hired by a Chinese company and when he or she uh, leave that company, she can, you know, take that technology to the local firms. Uh, and then the fourth one is the uh, competition, uh, the competition between uh, Chinese uh, firms and local companies. So following this typology, there's been a lot of uh, empirical studies. Um, so which are summarized here. Um, so the general, uh, uh, very general observation is that uh, the Chinese business that involves low level technologies such as garbage collections in Ghana, they can easily be followed by local entrepreneurs uh, who retrofit the local vehicles. But if the technology gap is very wide uh, between the Chinese firms and African firms, uh, there's no such uh, technology transfer. Um, and there are also other researchers in different countries, in like Nigeria, 
uh, or Kenya and Zambia, Malawi, in the, all these countries, find that uh, the backward and false uh, backwards and forth linkage between Chinese and local enterprises lacking. Uh, so there's no such techno transfer between you know Chinese firms and the, the African firms. But in all these countries, they find that all the job training uh, provided by the Chinese companies are very common. So um, I'll start from there. So um, so given that you know there's the huge uh, technology gap. And the absence of backward and forward linkages, and lack of uh, uh, local competitions. So we might just refocus on the um, inter uh, firm levels to see how this uh, technology transfer, if there's any, take place. So this is the approach I'm following. Um, so the. There are, um, I'm going to raise the three questions um, with regard to the interfirm arrangements. Um, the first is uh, who are the Chinese African actors in the technology transfer and what drives them to transfer or absorb technology? And the second question is that what types of technology is being transferred uh, and how? And the third one is are the technology transfers smooth, effective, and successful? And if not, why? So um, here I have to uh, mention that there are um, you know, some types of Chinese enterprises. Uh, so the first type is that the uh, SOEs, the state owned enterprises uh, operating in Africa. So they're close linked to Belt and Road Initiatives, um, which was officially announced in 2013 by uh, Xi Jinping. And the uh, project, uh, they operate in Africa always start from diplomatic uh, negotiations and are subsidized by the Chinese National Bank. Um, but there are also some state owned enterprises enter the African market uh, as contractors or trade firms working for the World Bank as early as the 1990s, a long, long, long before the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so it is observed that they are more open to political negotiations and conceptions uh, than just uh, you know uh, maximizing uh, the profit uh, globally. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there are um, lots of uh, private investors. So some of them just relocate to certain African countries uh, when they could not export the goods to um, industrial. Uh, or developed nations in the 1990s. So they pick like uh, countries with a uh, free market, like Nigeria. And also some formal employees of the state-owned enterprises, uh, when they see like there's a business opportunities in Africa and local car, uh, market, they just started their own business. So in general, um, these private investors are observed to have very long expectations of ex expectations of long term growth in Africa, so that's why you know even in countries where um, the uh, politics uh, um, um, quite unstable or there's no so called like the rule of law, um, these Chinese firms can survive. It's because of their hope. Um, and. Here, just want to remind you that uh, um, most of the private uh, investments uh, fall under the category of ATIs. Um, but many, many of the um, contract engineering and construction uh, projects uh, are carried out by the state enterprises uh, uh, with the help of the uh, diplomatic negotiations. So, um, I'll pick uh, Ethiopia as the research site. Uh, so here is the, um, the uh, something about the uh, this country. Uh, it's a landlocked country uh, with the uh, huge population, uh, second only to Nigeria uh, in Africa. Uh, and since the 1930s, uh, it has undergone a very term turmoil, like a regime change. 
So between 2003 and 2017, the Chinese investment, investment in, in Ethiopia has surged by more than 400 times. And now China is the largest investor in Ethiopia. Uh, and their relationship is characterized by um, strategic uh, pra uh, pragmatism, which means that there's not very strong like uh, ideological um, solidarities between the two countries. So they just need each other. Um, China needs Ethiopia as an anchor state, and Ethiopia needs China as investors. So now look, let's look at the um, three cases. The first case um, is about um, a contract project awarded to a China Chinese state-owned enterprises. Um, and it's actually um, the uh, headquarter of a commercial building, um, which is shown in the uh, uh, picture uh, on the left. So um, the um, process by which the Chinese company uh, win the tender is that because before they have constructed a large aid project uh, in Addis Ababa, the capital city of uh, Ethiopia. So they get a ticket, they get a trust, uh, and uh, uh, just because uh, they use the Chinese standard in the aid project, so they were able to continue to use the Chinese standard uh, in this new project. Um, and we can see uh, from the uh, right graph that uh, uh, there's the um, triangle, the power triangle, um, where there's a client, uh, which is a, a national Ethiopian uh, bank who uh, found the project. And then there's a constructor, that is a Chinese construction SOE. And the client just appoint, appointed a consultant to supervise uh, the construction process. Um, and the consultant is actually an Ethiopian Technology Institute and national standard maker. Uh, so it's a parastatal actor. Um, so the question is here, because Ethiopia did not have much in experience in building these high-rise buildings. So how can they supervise uh, these Chinese SOEs um, who both to have you know, built like, many of the sky skyscrapers in the world? So this is the very tension between the Chinese and the Ethiopian consultant. Um, so the Ethiopians, um, during the, uh, their uh, oversight, they make full use of the official capacity as a consultant. Um, and if there's anything that they are not clear, they just uh, demand the Chinese to stop the project and ask them to explain you know, the technology details. Uh, they even ask the Chinese to arrange research visits to Chinese universities uh, because they don't have you know, some of the uh, equi equipment to test the parameters. Um, and so um, often they ask the, the Chinese company to change the design and then re-evaluate it. And so by, by so doing, uh, they're just trying to, you know, uh, collect the data for the um, uh, their national uh, standards, which is ESEN. So here I have to expand a bit. So the ESEN uh, is a combination of the European standard, uh, which is ES, uh, sorry, the EN, European norm, and the Ethiopian standard. Um, the ESEN standard was quite old, uh, that date back to the 1995, so haven't um, uh, updated that. So this time they just take off the opportunity uh, to get some like a construction experience and the data from the Chinese firms um, to update uh, the uh, ESEN standard so that they can use these standards to supervise other domestic projects uh, in Ethiopia. Um, so there are a lot of contention. So one of them is that 
uh, the building needs to install uh, the glasses. Um, and there's the uh, industrial standards for the fire rating, which means that the, you know, the, the, the time uh, the glass can uh, resist the fire. So the Chinese techni technical lead find that the Ethiopians you just copy uh, the US standards, uh, which is like four hours. So which means that you know, the, uh, the glasses have to be strong enough to um, withstand the fire uh, in four hours. But the Chinese think it's, it's unreasonable. Um, because the aluminum, uh, the metal uh, for the frame of the glass, will melt in only like two hours. So the four hour uh, fire rating only applies to buildings with only like a concrete and steel. And the Ethiopian consultant argues that. Uh, why the double the reason why the double you know, the, the, the fire rating of the glass plating is that the uh, firefighting in Ethiopia is quite weak. So they need more time um, before the you know the uh, firefighters can put out the fire. Uh, but the Chinese were thinking, okay, this is not still not reasonable. And the real reason behind that because uh, uh, this the the the, uh, the payment of this project is in um like six percent in U.S. dollars and forty percent in Ethiopian birds. So the Ethiopian government or the commercial bank they don't have enough U.S. dollars. So that's why they postpone you know the process and using their um uh, the power as a consultant. So on the side of Chinese, you can see that they complain a lot. Um, they complain of the Ethiopian being textbook or stubborn uh, because the Ethiopian constantly holds the project and they slow down the uh, Chinese speed, uh, which they, uh, the Chinese take pride of. So what's behind the Chinese speed? Uh, there are a number of reasons, including the balance statement. So the longer you spend on the project, uh, the more money you will spend on the uh, uh, like the labors and the cost and the storage and everything. And there are also the pressure of a depreciation of Ethiopian birds, um, which is quite common in some African countries. So you need to speed up uh, the process in order to avoid such uh, losses of currencies. Uh, and all the Chinese staff, if they can, they will get uh, like some very decent dividend if they can you know, uh, finish the project ahead of time. That's one of the motivation behind the Chinese fleet. And then there are also the requirements of uh, technology that uh, you can't just uh, stop the project and resume that in a day or two. Uh, for example, if you just installed the, um, uh, the, the wire work, uh, the steel uh, wire uh, reinforcement, you have to pull the um, concrete uh, immediately. You can't just stop that. Um, so the Chinese become very anxious. So as a cultural response, um, they just uh, uh, trying their best to um, do a lot of favors to the Ethiopians uh, in the hope that they can speed up the uh, inspection process. So they provide food, beverage, and everything, and even rent the cars, and they treat them dinners, but it just didn't work because the Ethiopians just want to slow down the process and absorb the technologies. So the Chinese engineers sometimes they just even withhold techno uh, technical details and by deleting them from the uh, drawings, but sometimes uh, it backfire because uh, the Chinese workers need to see all these technical specifications to um, carry out um, the ground work or the work on the ground. Okay. Um, so we can see that the technology transfer between the um, Chinese company and the, uh, the engineers and the uh, consultant is not very uh, straightforward. Uh, but there's uh, another levels of uh, skill transfer. 
that take place between the uh, Chinese foreman uh, and the Ethiopian laborers. Um, so uh, to the left is the structure of uh, um, uh, this program. So under the um, this SOEs, uh, there are several uh, subcontractors. Uh, that is the labor companies, Lao uh, Gongsi, who recruit the skilled workers from China, and they also hire the local workers. So the SOEs is responsible for obtaining work permits of the Chinese workers, and they also pay the local workers. Um, but in fact, you know, this even the payment has been subcontracted to the labor companies. So the labor companies is re responsible for the recruitment and training and dismissal of the local laborers. So this kind of uh, uh, collaboration or, or labor division um, has long been practiced in China since the 1980s. And it just, uh, um, like a graft uh, to the Ethiopian context. So under this sub uh, contraction, um, we can see, you know, the Chinese, they have, they are motivated to um, train the uh, uh, local workers so that they can uh, meet the industrial standards and also to, um, you know, complete the jobs ahead of time. Um, the Chinese use um, carrot and the sticks uh, to um, motivate the uh, Ethiopian workers. So we can see that they're, um, they're sometimes they're all often like the verbal and the physical aggressions, but at the same time, they're also the reward of the Chinese to the Ethiopian laborers. Uh, if they can deliver, uh, they can just finish the job um, uh, and the quality jobs. And they also, uh, in the course of time, there's a shift from the day, uh, daily rate to piece rate. So in the beginning, uh, the uh, Ethiopian workers were paid daily by uh, 130 birds. But um, in the course of time, uh, when their productivity is improved, um, they, receive, they would receive the piece rate. Uh, and our China, uh, the Chinese workers also reward those who are uh, the, the Ethiopian workers who are uh, hardworking. Uh, they just give them like a contract with new one. Um, and it's estimated that 10 to 20% of uh, the Ethiopian laborers continue to work for the Chinese in the next uh, project. Um, so here's a case between uh, Chinese worker, Mr. Pan, and his workers. So what he did is that um, he often carry a script, like a ruler, and an iron bar with him. And when he see the Ethiopian laborers do not construct the, like the even walls, he just smash that walls using the iron bars. So this is not only to instill fear, but um, so, um, but 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 the Ethiopian uh, laborers uh, they also learn to uh, construct the even walls, and when when they do when they can do that, uh, he just commission the jobs to Ethiopian workers at two birds break, um, and he just retained you know the um, if he kept the uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, the payment uh, to the uh, Ethiopian workers and what he get from the labor company. So he profit from some contracting to the, the daily laborers uh, to the Ethiopian laborers. So you can see that the productivity of Ethiopian workers um, has been greatly increased from like 150 birds a day to um, 600 birds a day. So increased by four times. And let's look at the response of Ethiopian laborers. So in the literature uh, of the African agency, um, scholars all observe like there is the open defiance, the protest, 
or they use a pigeon to come from the Chinese authority, or if they are dismissed by the Chinese firms, they can just bring the Chinese to the court and they always win the cases because of the protective uh, labor policy of Ethiopia. Um, and in this project, uh, some of the workers, these this content workers, they can bring the disputes to Ethiopian consultant and client. So the Ethiopian consultant and express the uh, discontent to the Chinese uh, engineers um, and they correct their behavior. But I also observed there's a lot of um, like compliant uh, behaviors of these um, um, laborers. And there are reasons. So the first reason being that um, they will have their salary increase in proportion to the productivity and they can renew their contract and they can even promote to Ethiopian foreman uh, who, uh, and then they are going to recruit and lead the uh, Ethiopian laborers uh, who they uh, recruit from their home countries. So um, one of the case is that uh, there's a Muslim uh, who worked for the uh, um, Chinese worker. Uh, and in the Ethiopian context, uh, the Muslim uh, Ethiopians is unlike the Christian Muslims. They don't have the land, uh, and they um, often like uh, uh, in most of the cases they are tradesmen uh, or craftsmen uh, moving from cities to cities. So their motivation is quite different from you know those um, uh, farmers. So uh, they have no other choices. They have to stay in the cities and they have the very strong motivation to become like foreman or run, even run their business in the future. So that's why uh, they demonstrate um, many more uh, compliant uh, behaviors uh, uh, with the Chinese. And now moving to the third case. Um, this is the um, some private investment in an uh, industrial park uh, established by the Chinese. Um, it's called the Eastern Industrial Zone. Uh, it's located in Dukam or Ormi region. Uh, and now it hosts 140 Chinese factories, uh, which employs uh, 1,000 200 Chinese and uh, uh, 23 Southern Ethiopians. So we can see that you know, the Chinese presses contribute a lot to the uh, local employment. Um, and it was designed to model after Chinese special economic zones as a means to industrialize through export under the framework of Bokak. Um, but however, uh, when I conduct the field work there, I find that 90% of its manufactured goods are for domestic market, not for export. Um, the reason being that uh, uh, the um, level of the skill proficiency cannot meet the uh, in international standards. Uh, also because uh, some of the Chinese uh, firms, they just uh, export like low level technology um, to Ethiopia, uh, but this, they can still like profit a lot from this no, uh, low technologies. So it means that the production does not need to follow international standard, but just to meet the domestic needs. Um, and also the Ethiopian authorities, uh, they're not very quite interested in technology transfer. Um, but they are concerned more about um, the um, total production value, uh, gross tax, or gross import good values and employment. Um, they like this uh, statistics. Uh, so this is the um, uh, short clip of the uh, uh, industrial park. Um, so the question is, uh, um, who are motivated to transfer the technology uh, to the local? 
Um, and it's actually, I find that the Chinese bosses, they have a strong, um, they are strongly motivated to, to do so um, because they wanted to replace the Chinese skilled laborers with local workers because the salary of the Chinese worker they recruit from China is like 12 to 40 times of a local worker. And they call this uh, the substitution of um, by the uh, local workers as Ben Di Huang. Um, but it's also the risks because the trained workers, they can hop jobs and cause loose to the factory. Uh, and particularly when they begin to speak Chinese so that they can just bargain uh, with you know, the, another Chinese employer. Um, so this observation, uh, contrasting to the speed over uh, model proposed by Brotinga, um, because um, in that model, uh, if someone leaves the jobs, they can just join the local firms. But here in the industrial park, uh, even the workers leave their job, uh, they do not go to the local firms, but instead they go to other Chinese firms. Um, so let's look at the case of a uh, textile company. So it uses waste plastics to produce a textile. Uh, and like two years ago, it hires seven Chinese technicians and 140 local workers. So my informant, Mr. Hu, when he joined the company uh, one year ago, he cut the seven Chinese to only three, replacing them with local technicians. Um, considering that the salary of Chinese is like 40 times of a local worker, so he saved a lot of money for his boss for like 120 local workers. And then what he did is he picked one local as his apprentice uh, to lead. He picked that from, um, from two candidates. So one speaks Chinese and doesn't, but doesn't have technical uh, background. The other one, uh, Mr. Ibrahim, doesn't speak Chinese, but has some um, technical training background. So you can guess um, who he picked as his apprentice. So he picked Mr. Ibrahim. And this is how he trained this apprentice. He instructed uh, Mr. Ibrahim not to leave me by 10 steps and wait for me even when I use the bathroom. Okay, the reason being that uh, as apprentice, they have to um, stand by and pay attention to the uh, machine failures from time to time, so uh, they will understand why there's the uh, you know the machine failures, and he can observe how the master fix the machine, and and learn from them from from him. And Mister Hu also cultivates a kind of paternalistic bond by taking care of Ibrahim's life. Uh, he just joined the weddings of Mr. Ibrahim, and when um, Ibrahim's wife uh, was expecting a baby, uh, he just hired a room um, in the workshop uh, for the couple. And later, um, because you know the, uh, the noise uh, of the workshop may um, hurt the hearing of the baby, uh, so Mr. Hu is hired a room apartment for Mr. Ibrahim at all outside of the factory. So what I expect is the um, Mr. Ibrahim's loyalty. Uh, when there's a trust, you know, um, being built between uh, Ibrahim and Mr. Hu, uh, Mr. Hu delegated managerial authority to Ibrahim by requiring all operators to report any production-related problem to him. And also, whenever there's a labor dispute, he always ask, Mr. Hu always ask uh, Mr. Uh, Ibrahim um, to, to, to solve the problem. Um, and what a question is here, 
whether this this the cultivation of the bonds for producing guanxi uh, between uh, Mr. Hu and the local worker is something unique to the Chinese culture, or it has some. Uh, it's quite similar. It, it can be, you know, it can be similar to the local culture. So I asked uh, Mr. Ibrahim, and he said in in his language that there's a wala jala chu that define uh, the relationship between a master and his apprentice. So it means love one another in our mythia. Um, it happens between the old and the young, uh, between the teacher and the student, and the master and the apprentice. And the master can be angry or shot at the apprentice if he's bought any mistakes. And at the time, uh, the apprentice is not supposed to fight back, but he has to listen uh, and take the advice of the uh, master. He has even to say, okay, please, please, uh, don't be angry. Okay. Something like that. Um, and when asked uh, how long will it take to be a um, qualified technician, uh, Mr. Ibrahim said it will like take maybe at least five years. Um, because uh, in these five years, uh, they can experience this, uh, they can experience different kind of uh, machine failures, uh, and they can fix that uh, with the guidance of the master. So it's a long, long learning process. And also need this kind of uh, bond between the um, uh, the Chinese skill uh, uh, skilled worker, or in this in this case the production manager. Uh, and the local worker. Um, so, but still, um, his, Mr. Ibrahim's loyalty uh, to Mr. Wu um, was not um, um, was not sorry. Um, but still, like even uh, Mr. Hu expect kind of a loyalty of Mr. Ibrahim to him. Um, he could not guarantee that his loyalty is long lasting. So. Because there's a competition between the Chinese firms, and other firms can offer higher salaries. Um, but here again, so um, there's only there are only competitors you know, from among the Chinese, uh, and there's no local competitors. So that's why I call this. There's kind of a technological bubbles. Um, um, and what happened to um, this textile company is that there was a split among the three stakeholders. And one of the uh, stakeholders um, started over his business in Addis Ababa. And they both just uh, imported machines from China and poached technicians and operators from the tea company by promising the workers a double salary. So Ibrahim and uh, several mechanics and 30 operators left of the new factory. And then Mr. Wu uh, called Ibrahim to say, um, you have to, um, you can't trust that man. Um, because um, if there are any disputes between uh, you and the new boss, and you lose a job, um, you cannot just return to my company. So what Mr. Hu offered to Abraham is that he can equally increase his salary from 12,000 birds to 50,000 birds a month. Uh, that's a very decent um, salary in the Ethiopian city. Uh, but he will not tell the salary uh, to the other Chinese um, because 
if other Chinese know that you know he pays a uh, high salary to Abraham, uh, they will um, complain uh, Mr. Poor uh, for raising you know the, uh, the 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 salary levels. It's basically want to keep the salaries very low. Okay, so now we have discussed the three cases. Now um, I'll just come to reach some conclusions. So the first, let me characterize the African or the Chinese actors uh, in the uh, process of technology transfer. Um, so what I observed is there a trend to domesticize technology for domestic use. Um, so it's quite irony because, you know, in the first place, Ethiopian government would like to introduce Chinese investment to catch up with the world economy and become a regional manufacturing power. Um, but we can see that um, there is a reversion to domestic needs in terms of tax or employment and national standardization. Um, so they're not really um, uh, motivated for the um, international um, competitiveness. But there's a, like the national interest for the domestic needs. Uh, we can see that from case one and case three. So, and that happened at the um, level of the uh, state. Um, and the third, uh, sorry, the, the second observation is that uh, there's no such spillover effect, but because there's a technology bubble. Um, so both the um, state-owned enterprises um, and the private Chinese investment, they can they enjoy a rich profit margin in Ethiopia because of the cheaper, uh, the, the labors are quite cheap, and there's a wide uh, technology gap. Um, and the technology transfer just has taken place between the Chinese firms and the uh, Ethiopian laborers. Um, but there's the um, uh, technology bubble. Um, and beyond this bubble, there's no uh, technology transfer. And if you look at the agencies of um, the Africans in the process of technology transfer, uh, we can see that there are, uh, it is manifested in, at different levels. Um, and if we look at the first case, we can see that the technical institute um, it shares the uh, sovereign agency from the national bank, um, and they can position themselves uh, uh, itself as a standard setter, um, and they can really have like a very strong bargaining power uh, by uh, in the process of civil uh, the oversight. However, uh, because of the resistance of the Chinese actors, the amount of technologies being transferred from Chinese to Ethiopians uh, is quite limited. And if we look at the, um, the technology transfer at the foot levels, uh, we can see that in the course of time, some skilled workers have demonstrated conformity with the Chinese capital because of the possible um, career path and the salary increase they experience. So they sustain longer term relationship with Chinese firms and individuals from whom they acquire technology, uh, craftsmanship, and even managerial skills. Um, but again, uh, they could hardly transfer their expertise to their own business or other domestic employees because of the shortage of the capital. Um, and for the Chinese investment uh, or the investors, they do have the uh, they they do um, have the motivation to transfer the skills related to the production um, to the local workers, uh, which happened in the second case with the um, labor companies uh, and in the private investment. 
So we can expect that with the growth of the um, technolo uh, technical expertise, um, the local workers will also acquire bargaining powers in the future, uh, such as in the case of the job hopping uh, of Mr. Ibrahim. Okay, um, so here the um, key reference. Uh, that's my presentation. Uh, thanks for coming again.